So welcome my subscribers. Now, as you know, I don't tend to do that many videos. I'm not a YouTube content creator. I don't do this for a living. I don't make any money out of it. But I've been involved in the nationalist movement for 20 plus years. So when something happens that I have a strong opinion about, I do like to give my say and put my thoughts out there. And I'd encourage all other nationalists to do so. So when an issue does arise, all our thoughts are out there and we can take that shared knowledge and come up with a sensible approach to things. Now, the thing that has spurred me into action and ending my uh, normal silence is uh, Nick Griffin. The, uh, the one-eyed ghost of Christmas past has returned to the nationalist scene. Now, he's done a video that I saw and it was uh, Chris Mitchell put it on his channel because obviously he's had his fallings out with uh, Mark Collette and Laura Towler and PA and uh, whatever the, the wrongs and rights of that, I have, I'm proud to say I have friendly relations with both of them. But um, what, what Nick has done He's, uh, he's done this sort of slur job against PA. And uh, I think in a large part this is unfair. And I also think that, you know, it's in a, in a way it's also bitter in a, that he can't accept his day in the sun is over and pass on that torch to the next generation. And uh, this, this, sadly, this seems to be a, a continuous flaw with nationalist leaders because... Uh, I don't know if you remember when Nick Griffin took over the BMP from John Tyndall in 1999. Uh, John Tyndall couldn't accept it and John Tyndall was uh, quite sort of bitter and angry just like Nick is now. So uh, it's, it's a sort of sad uh, thing, reoccurring theme within nationalism. Now I'll go through the, the details of Nick's attack on Patriotic Alternative and uh, I'll um, look at them one by one and see whether there is any um, substance to any of it or whether there isn't. Now he attacked it as a government entrapment scheme. He implied Mark is being treated with kid gloves by the BBC. He implied it would soon be illegal. He implied Mark was a moral and physical coward. And... Uh, he made this bizarre sort of allegation that uh, Mark's scared to shut it down because PA Scotland will come and beat him up. And he, he bizarrely sort of said he can offer housing. So, uh, you know, he's, he's had years of uh, acrimony and uh, animosity towards Mark. And now he's almost saying to Mark, shut PA down, you can come stay in my spare room, which is, is a little bizarre almost. And he also said about Mark's uh, love of computer games and playing computer games with 15-year-old uh, boys. And he, Nick Griffin said it was creepy. Now, obviously, we'll look at this as well. But uh, to, just a bit about myself. I've been involved. I was involved. First of all, I joined the Tory party in 1995. Then I was involved in um, various right-wing groups, Traditional Britain, Monday Club, uh, Conservative Democratic Alliance, uh, Swinton Circle, uh, British National Party. I joined in 2003 and then I left for a bit in about 2006, rejoined in about 2008 and then finally left in 2014. I've also had slight involvement with UKIP and been to some of their meetings and I used to know Nigel Farage because he lives near Biggin Hill and I deliver his posts, so I'd, I'd see Nigel occasionally. Now, in terms of PA, I'm not a member of PA, obviously, because I live here in Lanzarote. I can't be actively involved in PA. Uh, so, so I can provide maybe a more neutral sort of viewpoint because... If, if in this drama we have Nick Griffin and the Templars on one side saying one thing 
and the signed up PA members on the other side saying other stuff, then people are just going to look at it and say, well, the PA, PA guys are saying one thing and, uh, and the Nick and the Knights Templars are saying another. Now, in the past, I have had my criticism of PA. I have accused, uh, I think when Mark started it, he was, he was maybe a little dogmatic. I mean, on, on stuff like the JQ and people who disagreed with him slightly, uh, he, he didn't like to hear other viewpoints. I also had a suspicion that he, he, want, he wanted it more middle class. And uh, also that he, so, so uh, he, was, he was sort of, when he first started it, I felt he was maybe a bit dogmatic, ghosting anyone that disagreed with him. And he maybe was, he was sort of against the, the old eccentrics who, who hang around these meetings and some of the more rough and ready working class type guys who turn up. Now, obviously, as time has gone on, I think, to his credit, Mark has grown as a leader. And, and he has become more flexible. And I've, I've seen this myself. And um, I've, I've had dialogue via email uh, with him and Laura. I've, I've never met, I saw Mark in the distance at the Red, White and Blue 2003, but I've not met him in person. I have met Laura in person once at Traditional Britain. And uh, I've, I've corresponded a little with them by email. And I've got to say, in their praise, they will answer inquiries and concerns. They will, you know, a, a, approach them in a friendly way. They will give people time who have got a concern about this or that. And uh, my criticism in the past about it being middle class, I mean, the PA may have attracted more middle class people but I don't think, as Laura said to me via email, you can't really accuse Mark of being anti-working class because most of the regional organisers for Patriotic Alternative are working class. So maybe I was a bit too, too uh, far in my criticism in my other video that I made where I said Mark's just trying to create a middle class BMP because PA is... A, a mix of working class and middle class and maybe even some upper class people. Now, the, the fact is, uh, as multiculturalism gets worse, the first people who were affected were working class, lower working, uh, so a lower middle class or working class people, people like myself. And now as it's ratcheted up, it's going to affect people further up the system. So there'll be less and less opportunities. And whereas once upon a time, a middle class lad, he, he, he wouldn't have been affected because uh, he'd have gone to maybe a, a top private school and his dad had known someone who could get him a job. Nowadays, that's not going to happen because his dad won't be able to ring up his friend in the city and get the, the upper middle class boy a job because there'll be some diversity quota stopping it. So whereas this was originally uh, at the expense of lower middle class or upper working class people like myself and people lower down the, the strata it's now gone up so multiculturalism is affecting people further up the social scale and this is why P patriotic alternative might have a slightly more middle class flavor and interestingly enough i once heard james o'brien the left wing traitor on LBC and he was saying he he looked at some of the the people who were, were constantly opposed to him on Facebook and he said the people who, who he termed the most racist or right-wing evil people they weren't people at the very bottom of society it tended to be people who were sort of upper working or lower middle class people like black cab drivers plumbers people like that because people at the very bottom they just sort of take what they're given and uh, Mark's often told the story about people on council estates who they'd support the BMP but they wouldn't be bothered to go out and vote so whereas people a bit further up because they may be a bit more ambitious and want more in life and they see 
the little bit extra that they could have aspired for and achieved in their life has been taken from them, they may be more likely to be involved in nationalism, whereas people down at the very bottom who are content to just sit with hardly anything and don't have so many ambitions, there may be, they might moan about it or, or make jokes, but they're, they're not concerned to the extent where they'll go out and try and do something about it, like the lower middle class or upper working class people. Now, as, as I say, Mark has, has grown as a leader, and so he's, I mean, I, I spoke, and he's learned to be less dogmatic, and uh, he said to me in an email the other week, he said, you know, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. If uh, we can have something like the Vox Party here, that's got Sivnat tendencies um, in, in government, that's far, far better than uh, the, the current left-wing socialist government. So we can't sort of say, you know, let's just dismiss everything that's not 100% in agreement with us. And I think Mark now, he's as he's grown as a leader, he's able to take a broader range of people with him. And you see this when parties try and be dogmatic and refuse to take a, a broad range of opinion, they suffer and they really do suffer. And um, there's been a crisis here. I don't know, you know, the, the Vox Party, which I'm a member of or was, uh, the, the, um, they got rid of one of their brightest stars, the lovely Macarena Alona, whose videos, you can see videos of her on my channel because I think she's brilliant. I think she's lovely, a nice person, a brave lady, a charismatic person, and uh, she criticised the Vox Party in, uh, in posts, in, in a newspaper interview, where she said many members... Uh, they didn't feel there was enough democracy uh, and debate uh, in it and there was too much of just the leadership, we want this approach and that's it. And I saw this myself in Lanzarote. I was, I was slightly involved with the Vox Party here. I'd still go. If they had a big rally, I'd still go. But we had, I mean, my, me and my Spanish friend Vincent, we used to go to, to the Vox Party, the big meetings, but... Um, the, the guy who runs the local group, Alfonso, he, he tends to be more of a Sivnat and he tends to only want people who, who, who he likes in it. And so he, he was always a bit suspicious of me because I suppose he's put my name into Google and seen oh, this, this evil racist fascist policeman who lost his job for his views. And so he was always a bit standoffish with me and he was the same with, with Vincent. And uh, so, so we both left and... And, and we had this here at local level, and Macarena said, in the national scene, the Vox Party, there's not enough democracy, there's not enough debate. You've got little local leaders and the high leadership saying, we want this approach, and refusing to tolerate any debate. And now Macarena, has, she did that interview, where she didn't reveal anything confidential or any personal arguments, and Vox just threw her out. And this has created a massive crisis in the Vox Party when we should, when we could be riding the wave of um, Giorgione Maloney's victory in uh, the Italian uh, general elections. We could be riding a wave of enthusiasm from that. And we, the fact is we're not because the party was stupid and they were too dogmatic and they were too narrow minded. And, and they just, rather than just say, look, Macarena, she's within our party. She's, you know, got a few differences of opinion with the leadership. Straight away, they said, she's thrown out the party. She's no longer part of us. And the minute you start doing that with parties, you just sort of become cult-like. And uh, you, you, uh, you, you lose ground you, and you create division and disharmony. And I think Mark, in... He has grown as a leader, and now within PA now, you will get various strands of opinion. Uh, I mean, to, to, 
to refer to the, the obvious one, the, the, the dreaded JQ. Now, I accept that anyone more loyal to Israel should live there. I accept that 70% of Jewish people are uh, left wing. I accept that they're slightly overrepresented in the liberal elites because of the average high Ashkenazi IQ, which is around 112, whereas the white average IQ is 100. I think the Chinese Oriental one is 105. So I accept that they're slightly overrepresented. I also am happy to criticise left wing Jews and say to them, why have you got an ethno state uh, where, with a policy of immigration based on race while seeking to deny European peoples the same. So I'm happy to point all this out, but where I part company with some of the more hardcore folks in the movement is this idea that they run everything within some big plot and that uh, Nazi Germany can't be criticised in any way. Well, again, I'd have kept Britain neutral in World War Two, and I accept they are overrepresented in the liberal elites. But this, this whole idea that oh, they're running everything, some big plot, that David Duke seems to love. I mean, David Duke, he can't seem to go three minutes without going in, mentioning Jews. And every, every question you ask him comes back round to Jews. And it, it, it becomes a bit Asperger's type obsession. And it's very 1930s flavoured. And normies will run a mile from it. Now, I'm happy to share a party with people who do have a more hardline view on it, but I won't be told that, oh, you're, you can't be here unless you have the hardline view. And Mark now, he's prepared to accept various strands of opinion within PA. I mean, obviously, we have to say we are ethno-nationalists, we're not civic nationalists like Tommy Robinson, but again, even with civic nationalists, I'm sure Mark and myself would be happy to talk to them and cooperate with them when our interests coincided. So a lot of Nick's criticism is is not not only wrong, but it's also very unfair and very spiteful towards Mark and Laura. Now the first big one he makes is that PA's a big government entrapment op operation. A big government entraption entrapment, sorry, operation. See, I'm bearing out the thing about right-wingers being thick, not getting the words right. So he says that the government want PA to continue for a certain time so they can get build up a database of all the young people who are involved or sympathetic to the far right. And then when they've got all the names, then they're going to make it illegal and shut it down. But they'll have all the details of all these people. So if anything ever happens in terms of uh, right-wing action or riots or terrorism, they'll have everyone, all, all of us, on a database. And this, according to Nick, is the, the strategy with PA. Now, the first thing is, Mark is legally aware. He has a solicitor, I think it's Robin Tilbrook of the English Democrats, check all of his videos. And PA, him and Laura have created a code of conduct. And obviously, I haven't read the code of conduct, but I'm sure in the code of conduct, it would say any incitement to violence or violence or encouragement of violence is totally unacceptable. And indeed, an organisation like PA is trying to avoid violence and young people going down the wrong route. So this idea that Nick has that they're going to outlaw it, well, first question is why? How can they if PA aren't doing anything? Now, if we get to the point where it is outlawed, that doesn't mean, again, that it was Mark and Laura's fault. Because I, I obviously studied the law when I was uh, in a police training college at Hendon, because I'm an ex-policeman. We, we did a great deal, obviously, on the law. So the law isn't static. Now, uh, to give an example, there's an arrest called breach of the peace. But 
in the last few years, I can't remember the exact year, but in the last few years, there's been a, an amendment to that law that you cannot arrest a bailiff for breach of the peace because there was a case with a bailiff in Essex called Bibby or something. And, and so the, an amendment was made to the breach of the peace law under common law that you, you cannot arrest a bailiff for breach of the peace. Uh, so, I mean, if you look between the lines at that, that bailiff, he was probably acting like a bit of a prat that the policeman on the scene felt the need to arrest him. But obviously, he contested it and he achieved this, this amendment to the law that a bailiff cannot be arrested for breach of the peace, whereas previously to that case, they could be. So the law isn't static, it can change. So even if we get to the point where the government does prescribe PA, which I doubt because of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the care that Mark and Laura are taking, it doesn't mean they were at fault because the law can be amended and the law is constantly developing. So, you know, the law isn't static. So Mark's doing all he can with a law that can change and develop. But he's staying all he can to stay on the right side of that law. But with a law that will change and develop, you can never be 100% sure. Now, another criticism of, of Marx is about uh, the, the plane of... Uh, uh, no, uh, another criticism that Nick has made about PA is Marx's hobby of computer games. Now... My hobbies, they, they don't include computer games. I think I last played computer games in about 1995 when it was the little thing that went under the screen. It was shooting up at aliens that come down the, down the screen. And that was when I was about 17. And uh, my hobbies now are, are going for a gym and swim, playing piano, learning Spanish. And when I was in England, I used to enjoy course fishing. But... Obviously, you haven't got that on Lanzarote, so here I've replaced that with scuba diving. So, but the thing is, those are my hobbies. That's what I enjoy. And obviously, if Mark doesn't want to go fishing or play the piano, or I think he does do fitness in the gym, obviously, fine. You know, get another hobby. And it's, I mean, it, it's good because, as Mark said, it, it builds comradeship because uh, it, it's something that's not politics that is, is building a, a friendship and unity within the movement. And obviously I don't need to answer Nick's absurd smear about it being creepy, as if Mark's got some, some hidden perverted agenda. I mean, that's utter, utter nonsense. I mean, we all know Mark is a respectable family man, and what he does with young people, he, he provides an enormous amount of help to young people today, and many young people feel alienated and lonely and depressed and they're suffering because there's hardly opportu any opportunities out there and they've got no free speech at their college or school and they feel alone and they feel they're the only one. And what Mark does, he reaches out, he helps these people, he brings them into a community. I mean, I've spoken on past videos about when I was at Exeter University. I was unhappy and lonely because there were... There were most of the people down there were private school people who I had nothing in common with and also a lot of them were left wing so again I had nothing in common with them and what Mark's doing is quite important he's reaching out to the young people and providing them a community and a bit of mentoring now I do have my reservations about this um, in terms of uh, so, some, not all, but some of the young people in the movement who sort of came in through the computer game sphere and the online sphere, they, they seem to think at times that it's, uh, you know, nationalist politics is something that can be played behind an avatar online like a computer game and um, my I mean one of my concerns about this was the um, 
the taste of lads, the absolute state of Britain lads. And they were sort of middle class boys who were very hardcore, but they were also very concerned about keeping their identity secret. Now, what's as we all know, what's happened recently is um, Chris Kearns, who was uh, the uh, companion to Euro and Nativist on that podcast, has been arrested in Spain um, under alleged uh, terrorism charges, which, I mean, amount to nothing, really. He, he ran a, a fitness group for young people, and he might have debated certain controversial topics. Well, uh, Chris Mitchell, to his credit, he did a, uh, a video in support of um, Chris Kearns yet, and um, it, it, he said, you know, it is a bit annoying that this subject seems to be an avoided thing to talk about from others. He is innocent until proven guilty, so I don't see any harm in highlighting the case. So our reply, my reply to Chris Mitchell was, who to his credit did a video in support of Chris Kearns, Charlie Big Potatoes. My reply was, I'll tell you what has annoyed me the most on this, Chris. It's not Mark and Laura. I'm sure they have been doing what they can behind the scenes. It is Euro and Nativist. They were his colleagues on the absolute state of Britain. Yet what did they do? They cancelled the podcast and they never went on PWR or anywhere else to offer a single word of support to their TASOB colleague. Ralph Wright Reaction called them the absolute state of bricking it. Middle class boys as fanatical about their Nazi LARPing as they are about staying anonymous. You had your disagreements with Charlie, yet here you are bravely offering help and support. These lads were his podcast comrades and I have heard nothing from them. Are they middle class boys playing games like on an Xbox or serious nationalists? Because their, their reaction to this implies the first. And I take no joy in saying this. Now, if Euro and Nativist have been doing a lot behind the scenes, I withdraw that criticism. But let me tell you, if I was on a podcast with someone every week and that person was falsely accused and arrested, I would be doing this on streams mentioning that. So this has been my, my reservation about the, the, the computer game middle class boys in terms of some of them seem to think it's it, nationalism we play it behind an avatar and we, there's no real world consequences well there are real world consequences and if you're on a podcast with someone and that colleague or comrade is arrested and falsely accused as, as poor big charlie big, big potatoes has been you come out on other streams and you show support. Now, if they have been doing a lot behind the scenes, I withdraw that criticism. But, I mean, the fact is, Charlie Big Potatoes has been arrested. And obviously, I'm sure Mark and Laura have been doing stuff behind the scenes, but they were the closest ones to him. They were his podcast comrades, and I've heard nothing from them. And I've not heard anyone I know, and I know quite a lot of people in, in the nationalist sphere, saying that they are supporting him or doing anything to him. The only person I've heard uh, uh, doing a stream in his favour is Chris Mitchell, to his credit. So, I do. I, this is my reservation around this sort of computer game middle class aspect to PA, is that uh, not all of them, but some of these middle class lads seem to back away from the real world action but in PA's credit as it's developing more and more and there is more activity on the street more action is being done in the real world so there'll be less and less of a chance for people to think that nationalism is just something you do behind an avatar so uh, as, I, as I say it's nationalism you know, you're with your comrades, you're side by side with your comrades, you stick up for your comrades, and it's not just talking behind an avatar. But, you know, to give Mark his credit, he's trying to move PA beyond this, because obviously 
it started online so that's the sort of environment it started on but hopefully it's now going beyond this so again Mark's uh, Nick Griffin's criticism that it's just middle class boys in a computer game pl club is again it's, it's unjustified because he's moving beyond this now the next one uh, the next thing that Nick Griffin throws at PA is he reckons Mark Collette is being given an easy ride by the mainstream media. <laughs> now this is a real classic because if you if you think about it, Mark has had the Times journalist Dominic Kennedy uh, doing slur articles on him. He's had Channel 4 getting a, a spy in his organisation. So he's had mainstream media dedicating thousands of hours to slurring him and saying bad things about him. And in every show, they'll put up the clip of the young Mark saying a few, uh, you know, close to the wind, harsh things 20 odd years ago. And, and and so this idea that you know it, it's a government op, and the government have told the BBC and the media to give patriotic alternative an easy ride. Is you look at how the media have treated Mark and Laura, and 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 it, it's just not borne out in the evidence. And now he. If, if we're going to talk about government front ops and what could possibly be some sort of government entrapment, of, of, government entrapment operation that the government is then hands off while they wait to see it develop so they can then go in at the right moment and um, get some prosecutions. I mean... The, the Knights Templar is, is, is like a shining beacon because the fact is you're selling swords, Nick. You and Jim Dowson, you're selling swords and weaponry and no one's come after you. And even if the swords that you are selling to these gullible Americans who are buying off you are blunt, if I buy a blunt sword, it doesn't take much to me to take it down a workshop here or a garage and have someone sharpen it up. So you're, you're, you're online selling swords and weaponry at Knights Templars and you've had no government pressure, no government uh, prosecutions, no um, media exposés. And yet PAs, PAs had all of this. They've had, they've had a, a member arrested. They've had, uh, well, no, they've had Sam Melia. He had the police raid his house and Laura. They've had, they've had thousands of hours off mainstream media of, of slurs. And, and, and there's Knights Templar and they sit there selling swords and weaponry. No one touches them and there's no exposés. So if I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, hmm, which one of the two is a government entrapment operation. Well, you know, it's, it's not red or black at the casino. It's not, not a 50-50 bet, is it? And, and with this, this Knights Templars, I've noticed Nick very much recently when he talks, because um, the Knights Templars is a, a religious-themed organisation, uh, and obviously Jim Dowson is quite religious, to his credit, uh, he's a veritable clear core almost, uh, you know, he's quite obsessive about religion. He, Nick Griffin is now dropping sort of more religious themes into a lot of his addresses. Well, I saw Nick Griffin speak back in the day three or four times, and he might have referred to Britain as being a Christian culture, but there was never any religious illusions or any profession of, of personal faith back in the day. So it's, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that, that Nick is so pleased that another group have, have let him join and be a prominent member that he's now pretending to have a, a strong personal faith 
that I never saw any evidence of back in the day. And I mean, uh, uh, you know, I heard him speak three or four times in person at least, and and I never heard any sort of religious allusions or professions of faith in in our plus speeches. I mean, I've I've said before about one of the amusing. Um, anecdotes he used to give back in the day I mean he said in the back room of a pub Mick would be there and one of these illusions he'd give he'd say about the hardship his family had suffered and he'd suddenly go we've eaten roadkill and he'd look at the audience and, he, and he'd let about a 20-30 second silence he'd let that sink in and then and they go, yes, we've eat, my family has had to eat roadkill. Well, the fact is, Nick, that's, that's not any great nationalist sacrifice. That's your bloody fault. Because let's face it, you were a boomer, so you had far more in terms of opportunities and education. You had a, you had a free ed university education at Cambridge. You had a company offer you a, a law apprenticeship that you turned down. And all you've ever seemed to have done, apart from politics, is uh, run the BNP, be an MEP, and uh, live off your, your wife, who's, who's a, who was a nurse of some sort. Now, if your family were eating roadkill because they didn't have any money, and you're a boomer, and you had all these opportunities, you think youngsters now, they, they start life, if they've got a degree, with 30000 of debt. They go for jobs where there's 100 people for every graduate job. And you're a boomer who got offered a job on a plate by a law firm who had, you know, low property pri prices, chance for home ownership, job opportunities, job security, far more freedom of speech than there is today in terms of if you say something wrong at work, you won't get sacked for it. So you've had all these opportunities and your family's eating roadkill. Where if you'd been born in the year 2000, I'd say, well, fair enough, have a bit of sympathy. But you're a boomer. And your family's eating roadkill. It's because you're a lazy gitnik. And you should have gone out and done a normie job. So that, that's Nick, one of Nick's classic anecdotes. To engender sympathy from the audience. And uh, it's, it's basic nonsense. Because there was no need for him to eat road, his family to eat roadkill. If his family ate roadkill, it was his fault. And, a, and just a side issue, another thing he kept on and on about in this video was Kai Murras, the um, Finnish right-wing philosopher. And then he went on about um, Kai Murras' uh, supposed praise of homosexuality. Now, I'm, I'm not a clear core. I don't try and police. I, I think it's very unrealistic and very silly to think we can police what people get up to in private. But everyone in our movement, we should be promoting the traditional family and no one who is that way should be using homosexuality as some sort of victim identity or promoting the LGBT agenda. So if Kai Morris is doing that and trying to provoke, promote homosexuality within nationalism, that is wrong. Because, yes, we can have homosexuals who are discreet and who don't feel the childish need to use it as some sort of identity, but uh, we we don't need people promoting it. But that said, yes, if this Kai Maris is trying to promote homosexuality within nationalism, that is bad. But again, the way Nick was speaking is like Kai Maris is the patriotic alternative philosopher. Well, the fact is, Kai Maris he doesn't even live in England, I don't think. And I've never hardly heard Mark mention his name. So this idea that Kai Mara said something and PA's at fault because of that, again, it's utterly ridiculous. It, you know, if Mark has invited Kai to speak at some event, I don't know whether he has or he hasn't, that obviously doesn't mean that, you know, he's 100% in agreement with all that Kai Mara says. Now, he, he's had Dr. Dutton come and speak. Now, Dr. Dutton doesn't identify as alt-right or a nationalist. He says he's a high Tory, but he still comes and speaks at PA events. So this idea that Mark's had someone to speak and then all of a sudden they're the PA 
uh, thought creator, is, again, it's, it's utter nonsense. So, again, it's just, you're clutching at straws here, Nick. Now, another thing that Nick says, he calls Mark a moral and physical coward. Now, I think this is totally unjustified and, and he's got no evidence to back this up and it's, a, it's a, a, a slur. Now, in terms of cowards, Mark is quite well known. I'd say he's easily one of the most famous nationalists in England at this time. And uh, obviously, Laura and Sam, they were attacked on the street. So they're both well known. Yet, as far as I know, Laura and Mark... Uh, and Sam, they're going about without any bodyguards, without any protection. Now, there was another nationalist leader who wasn't like this. Let me let me take you back. 2009, the back room of the uh, Prince of Wales pub in Nottingham, in Mottingham. There was a BMP meeting there. Nick, I think he, he either was just about to or he just had got elected to the European Parliament as the BMP first ever MEP, along with Andrew Bronze. So the meeting was obviously packed out. Now, 80% of the people at that meeting were, were male. So young BMP, some of them looked quite handy, quite hard. Um... So, so, you know, he's got he's got a room full of male supporters, many of whom uh, will be able to, to fight and handle themselves. Now, Nick arrives, his, his Range Rover pulls up, he, he pulls up in a, in a Range Rover with blacked out windows like his Tony Soprano. I was at the bar. I sort of turned round because I was buying my red wine for the meeting. I turned round because I thought, oh, Nick's here. I'll say hello. I couldn't get near him because he was sort of going into the meeting and he had a bodyguard in front of him. He had a bodyguard there. He had a bodyguard there and he had a bodyguard behind him. So he's going into a nationalist meeting full of sympathetic people and he's got four bodyguards with him. Uh, that supporters money has paid for and then he turns round and calls Mark Collette who I've never seen with a bodyguard who puts his face on the internet every week and then goes out shopping the next day with his daughter and his wife he's then calling him a coward now I mean let, let's face it suppose the left had tried to disrupt that meeting now, to get into that meeting, you either had to be a member, then you found out where it was, or you had to know someone who was a member who said, yes, he's all right, and can I bring him along? Or if you were just interested in turning up, you had to go to a redirection point. So the fact is, it wasn't just a meeting where anyone could turn up. It was a meeting that was packed with 80% with males, who, who, many of whom could handle themselves. Uh, so if, supposing the left had tried to disrupt it, how many people could they have got there? They maybe could have got 10 or 20 uh, spies in the meeting itself. And they're, what? they're in a room packed out with 100 male BMP supporters, many of whom are young and handy. And Nick... He thinks he needs four bodyguards there in, in, a, in, a, in a meeting where he's got hundreds of young men who supported him. Uh, uh, you know, a meeting that isn't just anyone, everyone knows where it is. A meeting that you have to be a member or you have to uh, go to a red redirection point or know a member, be friends with a member. And, and Nick feels he needs four bodyguards there. Uh, and then he's he's calling Mark Collette, who, who I've never ever seen with a bodyguard. Who, who he's calling him a coward. So you know, Nick, you and your you and your boxing blue from Cambridge, who's who's the coward, eh? 
And 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 you could say to me, oh, Nick back then, he was more famous than Mark is today, so he needs a bodyguard. Well, is is someone else? Ian Smith of Rhodesia. Now I met him. You can see he signed he signed the book. I met Ian Smith of Rhodesia. This must have been about the year 2000 in a Monday club meeting. And I'd read an article in the Daily Mail um, where one of their reporters had gone to Salisbury, which was the capital of uh, Rhodesia. I, I don't know if Zimbabwe, it's now been, oh, it's now called Harare, isn't it? So uh, Ian Smith lived in Harare and uh, the Daily Mail reporter went to see him and he just went to, to Ian Smith's house and there was no protection, there was no big wall, there was no bodyguards, there was no guard dogs. There was just Ian Smith in his house in Harare under, you know, under the tyranny of Robert Mugabe. And I actually said to Ian Smith, when he signed that book, I said, Mr. Smith, with what's going in on in Zimbabwe and the seizure of white farms that is going on, I said, aren't you concerned for your safety in Zimbabwe today? And he, 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 he just said to me, I don't have time, young man. I am too busy to worry about such things. So there's the leader of an entire country who was, who was far more famous than Nick Griffin ever was and he didn't need four bodyguards. So I'd say that proves Ian Smith is, is a little bit braver than Nick Griffin. Now you could also say, you say, all right, someone in, that's, that's not Britain. So you could say, all right, let's, let's look at someone else in Britain. And Nick was in more danger because he, he's, he was more famous back in the day than Mark is now. Well, Enoch Powell was a very famous um, politician. He was notoriously famous. And um, uh, he, he, again, he never walked about with bodyguards. And I think my Uncle Alan, he used to work in London as a young man in, for general accident. And he said, you just see Enoch Powell, you just see him walking about on the tube. Now, uh, Ed Dutton, the jolly heretic, he actually said that um, he wanted to read Enoch Powell's autobiography and he wasn't sure if Enoch Powell had written an autobiography. So this was the pre-internet internet days. So what does the young Ed Dutton do? The young Ed Dutton in the 1990s, he gets out his phone book, looks in his phone book and there's Enoch Powell in the phone book. And he rings up Enoch Powell's number and his wife answered. He said, oh, uh, Hello, is, is Enoch Powell? He, his, his wife said, no, he's out at the moment. And he said, oh, I'm just asking, ringing to say, has he, has he written an autobiography? And she said, no, young man, he hasn't written one of yet. So there's Enoch Powell. Not only does he have no bodyguards, but his number's in the phone book. And he's probably the most famous racist in post-war British history. And, and, and there's Nick Griffin walking into a meeting packed with sympathisers with four bodyguards. One there, one there, one there, one behind him. Four man mountains. And he's then got the cheek to call Mark Collette a physical and moral coward. Now, uh, part, part of this is, with, with bodyguards, it might not just be on Nick's part, that Nick is is a craven coward with all these four bodyguards. There's there's another aspect to this, and the other aspect to this is probably what ruined the BNP. It's ego. Now I listen to uh, Doctor Savage on talk radio, and he's a bit of a sieve nat, but he, and he's Jewish, but he's a very clever man. Says some very perceptive things. Now, about two or three years ago, he was in the White House to visit President Trump. And he was waiting in the reception room. 
and Elon Musk came in, the richest man in the world. And Elon Musk came in to this room in the White House and Savage said he had four bodyguards with him. And, and Dr. Savage was like, you're in the White House. It's probably the most secure place in the Western world. What, you think you're going to get mugged? You think you're going to get robbed? You're in the bloody White House. But he's there with four guards. Well, Elon Musk, he isn't stupid. He doesn't think he's going to get mugged in the White House. Why has he got four bodyguards with him in the White House? And a, and a big part of that is ego. And it's like, look at me. I'm so important. I go about everywhere with an entourage of four bodyguards. And, and part of this why Nick wasted all these supporters' money on an excess number of bodyguards in the BNP might not have just been cowardice, it might have been Nick's massive ego as well. Now we get we get to the final stage of this. Let, let's ask why. Why does PA exist? What why is it here? And the reason is because of you, Nick Griffin. If Nick Griffin had done his job properly, the BMP now would be the size of the French Front National, and Mark and Laura could be leading a BMP that was the size of the French Front National. But they're not. They've had to start all over again from scratch because Nick Griffin, you, messed everything up. Now, I mean, I've said before in other videos about, about the failure of the BMP. And um, one, one of the, one, maybe the, the point where it all started was the notorious question time appearance. Now, as, as Mark said on, on, on uh, PWR, Nick had the chance before that question time appearance, to go away and prepare and be all ready and all set up. And instead, he, he refused to do this because he'd been going around to meeting after meeting where he was fetid. And I saw him, and to be fair enough, with a friendly audience, he was a good speaker. He was a charismatic speaker. And, and, and I, I sat and I listened to three or four speeches of his in person and I, I wasn't bored. I was entertained. I was intellectually stimulated. So he's a good speaker. But the thing is, question time was a whole different ball game. He was going into a lion's den of people who would be you know, out to get him, out to show him up and, and, and smear him and discredit him. So he went in. And it was an utter disaster. And he, and he let us down and he failed to come out fighting. I mean, there's another video on this channel of lovely Macarena Alona. And when she's on telly, she comes out fighting. And that's all you can do. And Nick, I mean, what Dutton said, he tried to do a farage. And he thought, oh, I can come in, be a bit charming, and they won't attack me. Which was utter, utter nonsense because... He knew going in that all the people on that panel hated him. And in such a situation, all you can do is come out fighting for the audience beyond the studio. And he knew this was what was coming because Nick Griffin isn't a stupid man. And I have heard him say in person, in meetings, before the question time appearance, that the BBC had a left wing bias. And I know, Nick, I heard you say that before the question time appearance. So you said in meetings before the question time appearance, the BBC has a left wing bias. So you knew what was coming up, but your ego had gone so big then with the four bodyguards and the applause at the meetings that you thought, oh, I'm Nick Griffin. I'm, I'm, I'm Britain's best orator. I'm Britain's best debater. I can handle everything. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying by Socrates, and it says, 
My only knowledge is knowing that I know nothing. The minute you sit back and you say, I know it all. The minute you do that is, is the minute that you're stupid because there's always something you can learn. There's always someone smarter than you. There's always someone tougher than you. There's always someone better looking than you. So, you know, complacency, we've always got to guard against it. And doesn't mean you haven't achieved anything or you're not skilled at anything. But we always need to be prepared that we might come up across an opponent or a situation that is quite hard for us. And the way to be prepared for that is to be humble and to study towards that. I mean, my, my piano teacher here, Nancy, every bloody week I get told, my, my lovely Cuban piano teacher, Nancy, every week I get told, you're not a pianist, you're not a pianist. And she's not doing that to make me um, despair or give up piano. She's saying, when you get too big-headed, you won't achieve because you start thinking there's nothing left to learn. And that was where Nick had got to before question time. And he knew what was coming because I heard him say in meetings the BBC was biased and he failed to prepare because his ego had gone out of control. And the whole thing, it was an utter, utter disaster. So then after that, after the, you had, the, and I heard next day at work in Royal Mail, I heard, I listened to the conversations. I heard the normie saying bad things about him. I mean, numerous other people within nationalism who had normie jobs at the time would have listened out and heard the conversations the next day and heard people saying working class white people who should have been Nick's uh, you know, appeal, that they should have been the audience he won over that night saying, oh, he's an idiot. I'm never going to vote for him. He's an extremist, an evil Nazi. And, and it was your lack of preparation, Nick, that created this situation. So... With the question time appearance, the good ship BMP had been going up and up and up, and, and it now it, flo it, it, it plateaued, and it was no longer progressing. But then you made another bad decision. You overextended yourself in the uh, election of uh, 2010, the general election. You stood up too many candidates, and, and loads of money was wasted, and, and the BMP overextended itself. Now, at this point, there was a disaster. I mean, in the wake of question time, when we'd lost a lot of our momentum, what we should have done at that point was to just batter down the hatches and play the forthcoming general election conservatively. But Nick didn't do that. Again, his ego was blown out of control. He, he contested a ton of seats, lost his deposit in most of them, uh, probably nearly all of them, and, and then... After that, after the 2010 election, infighting broke out. And part of the, the internal weakness in the BMP was that Nick, because of his, his insecurity and his ego, he'd promoted sycophants. And, 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 and these sycophants, they were people who were out for the main chance and, and he ignored the talent. So he promoted the grifters and the sycophants. Now, my I've spoken about this before. The London Assembly, 2008. Richard Barnbrook was our candidate. Now, I'd known Richard Barnbrook in the London group in earlier on in 2003. And I never had a great opinion of him because, I mean, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd ring up activists late at night, pissed. Which is, which is hardly professional. And uh, he was involved in the Labour Party right up until 1999. So why on earth is Nick promoting someone who three or four years before had been involved in the Labour Party and hadn't got anywhere? So they're a failed Labour Party politician. So then you've got the suspicion, well, are they a serious nationalist? Because... They were old enough to be involved in the 80s and the, and the early 90s, and they weren't, and they're in the Labour Party. And, and, and Nick straight away is putting someone like that to prominence because he's a sycophant. Well, on the London Assembly, Richard Barnbrook, he fell out with Nick Griffin. after 20, I think it was after 2010. Now, 
I've, I've said this before in other videos. At the time, I was I was a, a postman, and I'd get up uh, five days a week to go to work at five o'clock, and uh, you know work at five thirty. Now on a Sunday, which was my day off for about six or seven weeks before that London Assembly election, I went all round my town, Biggin Hill, delivering uh, the 2008 London Mayoral and London Assembly leaflets. And Biggin Hill actually got one of the highest shares of the vote and they actually said to my friend, Steve the Decorator, how many people have we got out in Biggin Hill? And he said, it's just Gus out there on a Sunday morning. And, and I put in all this work and lots of other people all over London put in a great deal of work. And it was, it was a lovely leaflet as well. So the design department had put in a massive amount of work. And then when Richard Barnbrook fell out with Nick in the wake of 2010, what he could have done, he could have stood down without a by-election. I don't want to be in the BNP anymore. I've fallen out with Nick and given his seat to his number two, Eddie Butler. Did he do it? No. He, he stayed on as an independent till the term ended in 2012 for the money. 60000 a year. So all the people, all the foot soldiers, had put in a great deal of work for this man to get him on that London Assembly and he turned out to just be a grifter. And all the work that me and thousands of other members had done for free was for nothing. And it was Nick who chose this man who'd, only, who'd been in the Labour Party only a few years before to be our candidate in the London Assembly elections. And not only that, we never got near that London Assembly again because of Nick's unwise choice of candidate. And there's also the issue in terms of the wills with um, that Jefferson character who has the limp. Now, I've met... Jefferson a couple of times in passing at meetings he seemed friendly enough but I know that a lot of people were unhappy at the way money was being handled there and he may have had I think there were there were rumors that he, he had a slightly dodgy past well people can reform people can get better but there, there was a lot of unhappiness among members about the way money from wills and bequests was being handled in the BNP. So what you've got to say is, why did Nick, as leader, promote these people? Why did he have Richard Barnbrook on the, as his London Assembly candidate? Why did he have Jefferson doing the wills? When at the same time, there were people like Mark Collette and Jonathan Bowden who were obviously very, very talented, very, very clever people, and Nick is pushing them to the sidelines. And, and, and the answer is, Nick, he always felt threatened by people who had more talent than him. He always felt threatened by someone like Bowden, who was a better speaker than him. Nick didn't see him as an asset. He, he, saw, it, he saw it as a threat because of his massive ego. Uh, you know, maybe maybe Bowden will end up leader and he'll have the four bodyguards and the Range Rover. Uh, yeah, and this is this is the thing. In in the wake of 2010, Nick had appointed all these grifters and chancers out for the main chance. And when the infighting broke out, because they weren't loyal to the cause, because they weren't loyal to him, that they were they were willing to rip the whole party apart. You know, to get rid of him and destroy everything. And, and Nick, because of his massive ego, he couldn't just step aside gracefully after his failure on question time and in the 2010 election. He had to stand his ground and, and make the infighting even worse rather than just standing aside gracefully. And, and this is why the whole thing collapsed. Now, if, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very sobering story because I mean I know Mark dedicated countless hours and 10 years of work to the BNP myself and thousands of others that was our it seems our one big chance electorally and the reason Mark and Laura have got to start PA from scratch from nothing is because Nick he appointed sycophants and grifters 
and he ignored the talent and he messed up question time and, and then he wouldn't stand aside when the moment came so a ton of infighting broke out and, and this leaves British nationalism in quite a bad um, position today now if you think today we, we've just seen in Italy uh, this, this very week Giorgia Melonia, Meloni a, a far right nationalist in charge of a nation of 58 million people you've got Viktor Orban in Hungary you've got the, the Front National in France which is contesting presidential elections you've got a, a far right conservative government in Poland you've got the Vox Party I mean they may have undermined themselves by their foolish um, attack on Macarena Alona but they're doing quite well still. They've got representatives in the National Congress here. Now, what we've got, we've got a perfect storm. We've got the war in Ukraine, which may lead to food shortages in the third world with the lack of export of grain. Uh, we've got the, the fuel crisis because Russian gas isn't being exported. So bills are going to rise sky high. We've got the wake of COVID where the government went hysterical and thought it could pay everyone's wages. So the UK finances are in, in dire, dire state. I mean, I've, I've heard, I, I'm, I'm not a brilliant economist. I've got economics A-level, but I'm not a brilliant economist. But I think if interest rates go up just two or three points, the government in Britain will be paying more interest on their borrowing, just the interest, than they will for their whole NHS bill. And I think they're already paying more on the interest on their borrowing uh, than they are for the entire armed forces. So things are really, really dire. The war in Ukraine, the fuel crisis and the terrible winter that's coming, the terrible winter of hardship, the mass immigration that's going to get worse, the LGBT fanatics who are really ramping this insanity up with the drag queen story hours and they're pushing normies to the point where like this is enough, this is too far. And we've got all this going on and it's almost like a perfect storm. And us nationalists, we should have a strong, registered, powerful electoral party in Britain to be able to seize on this and take advantage of it. But we haven't. We've got Mark and Laura, bless them, they're trying their best to get PA registered as a political party, but they're having to start from scratch. And, and this is this is the problem and, and this is very very disconcerting that we're now in a situation where we've got a perfect storm where the time is ripe for nationalism and, and, and PA sadly they're not well developed enough at this point to seize on that I mean hopefully they will be in a few years time but the reason PA exists the reason Mark and Laura aren't leading a BMP today that is the size of the French Front National is because of you, Nick Griffin. So making all these slur videos against Mark, when him and Laura, whatever their faults, and they're not perfect, they're trying to do something, is, 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 is even more unreasonable. And it smacks very much of bitterness and jealousy. And you criticise John Tyndall because he couldn't accept that his day in the sun was over. And now you are doing the same thing. But to give a white pill to finish with, we are going into this perfect storm in terms of the economy and the war and the, and the borrowing and the fuel crisis. And PA, hope Laura has worked out a plan of how PA can develop as the years go on. And she's got a goal for year five, a goal for year 10. So... You know, we're all aware this, this won't be solved tomorrow. It will be a long war. Now, we might think, oh dear, what if uh, poor Mark and Laura, when they finally get the chance to solve all this, they're in, they're in their 60s. Well, I've got, I'll finish with a white pill. I was reading this very good book by Ackroyd on, uh, on Venice, on the city of Venice. And I think he wrote one on London, which I haven't read yet. But he wrote this very good book on Venice and he wrote about the doges. And in here it says the average age of a doge of Venice was 72. 
So we've just got to hope that Mark and Laura, when the time comes, they can be like a Doge of Venice. I mean, the most famous one is Enrico Dandolo off the Fourth Crusade. But we, we've just got to hope that Mark and Laura, they can be like a Doge of Venice. And at 72, they can, or 60-odd, or they, they still have the energy and the conviction, the charisma that they've got now and are able to lead us and maybe solve some of these problems. And if it doesn't happen before that time, it's not their fault. They've had to start from scratch. And why have they had to start from scratch? Because of you, Nick Griffin. So maybe a bit less carping and, and bitterness and insulting against people who, whatever their flaws, they are trying their best to clear up the mess that you left nationalism in in Britain. Right, thanks for your time, my friends. And uh, hopefully I've covered a lot here, but I've covered the main issues concerned. Good night.